say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Oh, excuse me. Um, <coughs> beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And be afraid of the iniquity of my sins. We observe a moment of silence to reflect on God's word and examine our hearts. Every mountain and hill be made low, 
The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice, a voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows on it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the, our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms, he will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. This is the word of the Lord. Please turn over toward the bottom of the front of our insert sheet, as we will say responsibly together. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the mouth of the Lord be blessed. The epistle comes from 2 Peter 3, beginning with verse 8. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for the hastening, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent, be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us rise in honor of our Lord and read the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter, beginning with the first verse. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea, and all Jerusalem were going out to him, and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, and wore a leather belt around his waist, and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We now confess our 
Christian faith as we say together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under conscious Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and solid church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Dear friends, 
in Christ Jesus. One of the last prophets of the Old Testament, a man by the name of Zechariah, drew some delightful word pictures about the Messiah's coming. And one in particular, he describes the excitement that the people would feel, quoting him, many people and the inhabitants of many cities will come. And the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let us go at once and entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. John the Baptist's ministry seems to have been in fulfillment of that prophecy because it generated that kind of excitement. The air was alive with news. I mean, consider this in an age of no television and no radio. Just by individuals' word of mouth, the people turned out. They went out, way out into the wilderness to see what all the commotion was about. And when they got there, they saw this rugged preacher in scratchy clothing with an odd diet, uttering strong words about repentance and forgiveness. It had been 400 years since a prophet from God had last spoken. And so their souls were hungry, and they knew that what John the Baptist had to say was vitally important. Okay, so let's fast forward now to 2014. During this Advent season, we are preparing to celebrate the coming of the Son of God. And certainly things have started to ramp up for the Christmas season, but it's only December 7th. There's still plenty of time for us to focus on that which is most important. It will serve us well to hear the same message, the same call to repentance, in order that the Savior may come anew into our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. So what the Baptist declared to the people nearly 2,000 years ago to get ready for the first Christmas, well, get ready for the receiving of Christ's earthly ministry, that message remains the vital message for us to hear today. Repent and believe. There is a need for repentance in the lives of all Christians, and not just every once in a while, and not even just once a week. The need is for daily repentance. And if something struck me, as I was listening to uh, one of those talking head news shows, uh, that whenever a semi-religious or moral topic is brought up, like abortion or gay marriage, what struck me is that sin is not a popular word. People don't like to hear that word. The whole concept of sin is regarded as, as old-fashioned. It's offensive. The old Adam of our sinful nature protests that other people, you know, like terrorists and criminals, they may be sinners, but not nice little old me. However, when sin is not confessed, it shows that there is no desire for forgiveness. There is no urge to turn to God, no chance for healing. And so we need to repent and we need to do it daily, especially today. There was this Lutheran pastor by the name of Reinhold Dorman that I thought was interesting. He shared an encounter that he had with a young married woman who, who had been coming to his church rather regularly, but who told him that she wasn't coming to his church anymore. <coughs> After some probing, the reason became clear. She did not like the words of the confession at the beginning of the service. She felt that they were a put down, that they were poor psychology. The words of the confession had hit home, and she didn't like it. But what was truly sad is that in her anger and indignation, she missed something important. She missed the words of forgiveness. May we never forget the call to repentance, but let, it be even, let us be even more careful 
to remember that we receive forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. As the Apostle John wrote in his first epistle, but if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does that sound familiar? They are words that are part of the liturgy in Divine Service 71, which apparently are so attached to I wanted to read this morning. <laughs> they are words which we should apply to our hearts each and every day. Why? Because sin alienates. It makes us enemies of God. It makes us unfriendly, uncooperative, uncaring. It excludes God from certain parts of our lives. Now you would think that during the Christmas season, more people would find it easier to focus on God's love in Christ. After all, we are supposed to be celebrating Jesus' birthday. But the world has hijacked the Christmas agenda. And the one place they don't want us to go is to Bethlehem. Like that great Christmas prophet Isaiah once wrote, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. It's not merely that we don't want to turn around and follow God, though deep down in the soul the sinner may feel that way at times. No, it's rather that we cannot turn back around toward God unless he helps us. And so God comes seeking us. He comes all the way to where we are in our dirt and our filth. That's what Christmas means at its very core. God comes down to earth. He touches us. And he pleads, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Oh, we resist his plea, but his love turns us around to look at him. And we see a face of mercy and compassion. We see the one who loves us with an everlasting love. Now on the topic of sin, the worst sin would be idolatry, violating the first commandment. It happens when we make our own gods, earthly gods, who permit us to enjoy life completely, comfortably. The Israelites had their golden calf where they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Sounds a lot like an office Christmas party. Today people who readily cast off restraint, especially at Christmas, don't they? Hence the decline in morals. Borrowing from the idea of our text, the practice of filling our lives with hills and valleys and following rough and crooked roads. I was reading somewhere in the last couple of weeks an article from 20 years ago, Time Magazine, an article about future trends that was entitled Kingdoms to Come. And in this article, the writer attempted to describe what religious conditions would be like in 100 years. He writes, theology is a dying art. School children are ignorant of the Bible and henceforth bereft of their spiritual heritage. The colorful creeds of olden times are tiny and extinct. The article speaks of the rise of no demands faith systems that will increasingly arise. I would have described them as anything goes, systems of self-centered philosophy. Again, quoting the article, the triumph of feminist religion caused many Christians and Jews to shun references to God in personal terms. No more Lord or Heavenly Father. This in turn strengthened the groups that worship a mysterious nature force or seek to deify themselves. And what I thought was sad was that we don't have to wait 80 years. This is what this magazine article describes as happening right now. And it's a perfect description of the sin of idolatry. It is Satan's lie from way back in the beginning. You shall become like God. This is why we desperately need the righteous Lord to come and enter our hearts. In preparation, we repent and we ask him to straighten out our lives. 
To help in that regard comes the forerunner of the Lord, John the Baptizer. No, the message he proclaims is probably not going to be featured in any of the holiday Christmas specials you watch or be heard in the refrain of any sleigh song favorite. In the desert of the glitz and glamour of Advent 2014, the forerunner of Christ takes various forms. But he comes to us with one consistent message. Repent. It comes to our conscience as we recall passages of God's word guiding and correcting us. Repent. It comes to us through some trial or trouble, some event or experience that God uses to wake us up. Repent. It comes through the words or example of a Christian friend who reveals to us what is real and what is fake about the various celebrations of Christmas going around us. Repent. Repentance is the important message for us to hear. Because through repentance we find forgiveness. Sin may seem great, but the grace of God is greater. John the Baptist pointed to the greater one, to Jesus, who came with power to break sin's hold on us. The psalmist declares, but with you, O Lord, there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Therefore you are respected, therefore you are looked to, therefore you are believed in. John felt unworthy to untie the shoelaces of the one coming. So awed was he by the Lamb of God. Dear friends, repentance still finds forgiveness today. Because of his great love, God, whose holiness is like a consuming fire, does not consume us. Repent. Turn to God and welcome him who comes to you in the name of the Lord. He came to you first in your baptism. He comes to you in holy communion. He comes to you in the power of his word. And sometimes he comes to you through the quiet voice of a fellow believer, a wise grandfather, a devotion shared by a friend, a personal word written in a Christmas card or a child reciting your heart in the Christmas service. Repentance finds forgiveness, but it doesn't stop there. No, repentance also leads to renewal. As Jesus comes and forgives us, he breaks sin's hold on us. He comes with the power of the Holy Spirit, who functions as God's own purifying fire. It's the Holy Spirit working through God's word and the sacraments who smooths out the roads in our lives, making the crooked path straight, leveling the hills, filling in the valleys. Repent. Turn away from anything that would block the Holy Spirit's attempts to renew your life. Through repentance we find forgiveness and we are renewed, but unfortunately we are not made perfect. At least not in this way. Sin still has a habit of clinging to us. And the devil will always be at work. But it's wonderful to know that we are never alone. That the Holy Spirit will always be there to lead us through the rough times. Moreover, the Spirit will guide and motivate us to turn away from selfish, self-centered pursuits and instead serve God and our neighbor in whatever place the Lord puts us. Repentance leads to renewal not only in our minds and spirits, but also in our world. And that happens through us. This is the opportunity which is uniquely ours, I think, during the Christmas season. In our own personal way, we can be God's Christmas lights in the darkness, in our homes, offices, and schools. We can share the true reason for the season and demonstrate the love of Christ at work and at play. We can let our faith shine everywhere we go, driving out the darkness with the brightness of God's salvation, which was made possible by the day of Bethlehem. God does not call us to withdraw from the world, to lock ourselves away from all contact with this dark and sinful place. No, instead he comes to us like he did on that first Christmas, he comes and he equips us to repent, and to believe, and to share our faith with the world. 
Oh, we're in the world, but not of it. The people of this world travel a different road in a different direction. They are of a different mindset, especially at Christmas. But don't, let, don't get discouraged. God has given us life in this time and in this place to let our light shine so that we might be beacons of hope and salvation amid the darkness. God calls us to live in daily repentance and in the power of his forgiveness. This is our Advent preparation. This is our Advent proclamation. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may keep your hearts and your minds with faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us rise for prayer. In our prayers this morning, a prayer for Helene Rudlowski, who will be having surgery tomorrow at St. Mary's in Saginaw. And we pray for our members in physical need. A prayer of thanksgiving for Irene Bauer, who had a successful hip surgery this past week. She is now recovering at McLaren. We ask God to bless her in her recovery. Irene Wagner, who is in rehab, Jan Walter, who is under good treatments, and Jim Hoff, uh, the husband of Rosemary, who will be undergoing a new medication regimen uh, soon. Also, comfort for the family of Lorna Ruger, uh, the mother of Kim Boulder, sister of Amir uh, uh, Uh Lorna died last week. Her funeral was at St. John Amleth on Thursday. His father has been Gracious God, Heavenly Father, guard and keep our hearts during this busy Advent season. Help us to focus on repentance, 
and the gift of the Christ child through whom all our sins are forgiven. May this remain the focus of our Christmas preparation so that we may celebrate a gift that lasts forever. Lord Jesus Christ, in your ministry you healed many with frail and diseased bodies. Be present with your servant Helene as she undergoes surgery. Bless her with faith in your loving kindness and protection. Endow the surgeon and medical team with alertness and skill so that if it be your will, the surgery may help your servant to a speedy restoration of health and strength. O Lord, look down from heaven. Behold, visit and relieve your servants, Irene Bauer, Irene Wagner, Jan Walter, and Jim Hoff, for whom we pray. Look upon them with the eyes of your mercy and give them comfort and sure confidence in you. Defend them from every danger to body and soul and keep them in safety and peace. Lord God, the maker of heaven and earth, the giver of life, we thank you for all the mercies that you granted to Lorna Ruben during her earthly life, especially for calling her to faith in Jesus Christ. Comfort her loved ones who mourn her death with the hope of the glorious resurrection and a happy reunion in heaven. Lead all of us to remember that we are mortal, so that we will ever prepare our hearts to fall asleep in faith and finally receive the glory promised to all who trust in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. <coughs> the Lord be with you.
unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. And we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. shine upon thee, be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. Repentance always leads to forgiveness and renewal. 